Hello, and welcome back. Let's finish up Chapter 1, Module 1. Today I'm going to touch on some of the highlights, prepare you for your first quiz, and set the foundation for your first assignment. So let's go ahead and get started. In the opening of the first lecture, I introduced the objectives for Chapter 1. These are the learning objectives that I'd like to see you take away from the first module. One way to measure your understanding is to use a simple assessment tool such as a quiz. So this would be a prime example of a question. What is the government's role in the U.S. healthcare system? And you should be able to rattle off financing, reimbursement, regulation. So let's continue on. Please open your book to page 10. Another important characteristic of the U.S. healthcare system is that private financing represents over 50% of total healthcare expenditures in the country. If you move on to page 11, access. You should be familiar with access. Access is the ability of an individual to obtain health care services when needed, which is not, I repeat again, which is not saying has health insurance. So how do Americans gain access to health care services? A large majority have insurance from their employers. Another large segment has insurance from government health care programs. Some are able to buy insurance on their own why others rely on charity and subsidized care. Make sure you have a firm understanding of the quad function model. It'll come up time and time again, particularly in chapter six. So here's an example you might see on a quiz or a midterm question. Which quadrant or which quad function would reimbursement be in? So the first of the um, four functions are financing and insurance. The next two are delivery and payment. And if you look at payment closely, you can see that that's where reimbursement lies along with, you know, premiums paid and then how much that, you know, a patient pays in comparison to an insurance company, that'd be a copay. Again, a lot of this is going to come up in Chapter 6. Let's turn our attention back to access. Your book says on page 11, under U.S. law, hospital emergency departments are required to evaluate patients' condition and render medical needed services for which the hospital does not receive any direct payments unless the patient is able to pay. This is a game changer and this is a law or act that is causing some difficulties and problems with the Affordable Care Act. The name of the law is called the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act or MTALA which came about in 1986. The question that arises is does this apply to every hospital? The statute defines participating hospitals as, as those that receive payment from the Department of Health and Human Services and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. And actually, there's very few hospitals that do not accept Medicaid. Therefore, this applies to almost all hospitals in the United States. This act is in the news on a regular basis. Many feel that this act has impeded the progress of the Affordable Care Act. If you read the cartoon right here, the government can't make me buy insurance because I can go right here and, and they'll pay for it. They can't make you buy insurance, but they can fine you or have a penalty. And the penalty right now is for 2015, it's $325. And for 2016, it's going to go up to $695. Is that enough to get people to purchase the bronze, silver, and gold plan with the Affordable Care Act? The question is, are these penalties enough? Let's take an example. So, if an individual is going to buy a bronze plan through the Affordable Care Act, and let's say it's $200 a month, multiply that by 12 months, it's going to cost them $2,400 compared to having, to having to pay a fine of only a few hundred dollars. So is that enough incentive? That's the question. The other issue that occurs is what happens once a person has insurance? Will they use health services to a greater extent than if they were to pay for these services out of pocket? This concept is referred to as moral hazard, and it affects both the patient and the provider. Another issue that's happening with the Affordable Care Act is people are purchasing the insurance through the Affordable Care Act, paying for the insurance, then having a lot of different procedures done, and once they're healthy and well again, they drop the insurance. Also, we can, use, we can look at moral hazard in terms of the provider. An example of moral hazard from a provider's perspective, consider a physician's practice where they purchase an expensive piece of equipment. They have an interest, a financial interest, to 
require more tests, or have additional treatment to offset the cost of the machinery. In essence, these groups have created an artificial demand, sometimes referred as a provider-induced demand. Also, this is where defensive medicine may come into play, where a physician or a hospital requires additional tests to avoid any litigation and protect themselves from any malpractice suits. Changing gears a little bit and to help you on your final assignment in this particular module, I want you to be able to distinguish between the United States and other wealthy nations. So the top 25 developed nations in the world have some form of universal coverage. And the example that is used quite frequently is Canada, Great Britain, and Germany. The three systems I'm gonna go over are prime for a midterm exam question. So when someone says a national health insurance, I want you to think about Canada and the characteristics of their system. The government finances healthcare through taxes and the care is provided by private providers. The next example is a national health system. Think about Great Britain. It's supported by taxes. The government manages the infrastructure for the delivery, all the medical operations, and all the providers are government employees. Finally, Germany. Think socialized health insurance. It's financed by government mandates, both for employers and employees. Health care is delivered by private providers. Insurance and payments are closely integrated, and the government exercises overall control. As you work on your project, comparing the United States to other foreign countries, consider this list and the trends that are happening. Also, understand that the Affordable Care Act's requirements represent both an opportunity and challenges for the healthcare system. As we shift from a focus on illness to a focus on wellness, going from acute care to primary care, the primary physician should be the gatekeeper to additional services to control costs. Rather than put somebody in the hospital, we're moving towards more outpatient, less focus on individual health and more on the community as a whole, trying to move away from fragmented care to more managed care, working together as a team, more integrated services. That's the goal and that's the direction that you as a manager should be striving for. It's an exciting time and if you can position yourself to take advantage of these new opportunities, both for yourself and for your company, it can be very rewarding. It's also important that you take advantage and identify training needs for your company and for yourself and be prepared for these new regulations that the Affordable Care Act will bring. So, closing out this module, what are some of the takeaway points from the signing of the Affordable Care Act? You know, overall the goal is to increase access to health care and make it affordable to everyone in the country. All U.S. citizens and legal residents are required to have health insurance or they will have to pay a fine. Some of the ways that the uninsured will be covered is through Medicaid expansion, which we will discuss in later chapters, and government-run exchanges, as well as insurance companies will have to change and they will be required to include coverage for a variety of healthcare services, including pre-existing conditions. Thank you.